Yeah. Okay. Hi, Kelly. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Iona? I'm doing well. So um, thank you so much for being here um, in this crazy virtual space that we are all now learning to navigate. Yeah. Um, so I just want to give our viewers sort of the backdrop of the intention of, of what we're up to here today. And mm -hmm. So I am Iona Smith, and I'm here representing the Southern Berkshire Community Health Coalition and the Railroad Street Youth Project. And we had in our planning for our Spring Parent Education Forum um, been in communication with you to do a presentation about navigating adolescent um, depression and anxiety. And we were going to be doing this live. The parents were going to be able to come and get some tips about um, about just that, navigating these issues for their young people. Um, and then, of course, we're now living in a completely different world than the, that original plan. So thank you so much for being game to do this in a Zoom recorded format that we'll be able to send out. And maybe more people will see it in, the, in this format as well. Um, so the real uh, impetus for get, getting this together is that um, the students in Southern Berkshire uh, County have been taking a survey uh, called the, the PNA, the um, Prevention Needs Assessment. And the most recent one that was done in 2019 was eighth graders, 10th graders, and 12th graders, which is how they, they do that. Um, and over, uh, right around 50% of our young people in those three grades were reporting that they have depressive symptoms. And in the world that we're really interested in with the coalition about um, the health and wellness of our young people and prevention work, um, you know, we know there's a correlation between mental health and, and substances in a way that, you know, many young people self-report that they're, um, that they're self-medicating, really, and that the issues are other things, that they're dealing with anxieties and depressions. So... Thank you so much for joining us here in this virtual space. And just to let the audience know, we're, we're doing the best we can as we learn these technologies of Zoom. And uh, there may be dogs and motorcycles out the window going by. But I'm just going to pass it over to you and let you do a little bit more. We're so excited about your expertise, about who you are. And, um, and we'll let you go from there. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you to Railroad Street in Southern Berkshire. Community Health Coalition. Um, this is such an important topic, especially right now in this time of COVID and this time of mm. what's happening in our country. So um, thank you so much for letting me be here. So my name is Kelly Heck. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, which means if you're talking about me, you would use those pronouns. Like I saw her presentation or she made some really good points about anxiety. I have been a clinician practicing with children, adolescents, adults, families um, across the gamut since 2003. So I've come here today to talk to you about that from a clinical perspective. I want to be really clear that this is not a substitute for treatment for anxiety or depression. And if as we talk today, if anything resonates with you, it feels like you are having an experience or someone in your family or a loved one is having an experience that sounds like some of these symptoms, I really encourage you to reach out and seek some professional advice for that. And we'll be talking later on about some local resources. So I love to talk about anxiety. I love to treat anxiety. And it's because it's so treatable. I know it feels really uncomfortable and it's really hard to manage and it can feel heavy and really weighted. But the truth is it's really treatable. And so um, to be clear, some people do use medication to manage some of those physiotherapy physiological symptoms, but the trick is that it's your thoughts and your brain that really kickstarts that anxiety response in your body. So the great news is all of that can be retrained. We can retrain all of that, and that's how you would, you would want to reach out to a professional and help practice some of those things. So anxiety really is about more than just having worries. And sometimes, too, people think, oh, I'm not afraid of anything. I'm not afraid of spiders. I'm not afraid of heights. Therefore, I don't have anxiety. But anxiety is really about more than just being afraid of a thing. So we'll talk a little bit about that today, too. Um, so what I'd like to do, I have a couple of slides that I'd like to share with you. Um, 
and pardon me as we float through the technical world of how to do these things. So, anxiety and depression. Let's talk about for a minute, what does anxiety look like? So when someone you love or even yourself, um, some of the things that you might see is a strong repeated avoidance of certain places, certain situations, because they believe that something negative or bad is going to happen. So this might look like refusing to walk a certain route to a place or refusing to go to certain um, events or large gatherings or things like that. Um, it also might be a significant and lasting change in behavior that either happens pretty suddenly or happens pretty dramatically. So increase or decrease in what you're eating or in how much you're sleeping. It might be starting up or increase in substance use or substance abuse. So these things are generally strategies that people adopt to try to manage some of these anxious thoughts. Um, healthy strategies, not so much, but um, when those things happen, that might be a, a key that anxiety is something that might be happening. What does it sound like? It can sound like what if statements followed by really negative or worrisome scenarios. So, you know, we all have these kinds of worries, like what if I fail that test or what if I'm starting a new job and I don't do so well, but anxiety um, in a clinical sense would be sort of bigger than that. Like what if I mess up the game for everybody and we lose and we never go to nationals and it's all about what I did? Or what if I go to this party and they don't like me, they hate me, then I'll never get invited to anything else again. So what ifs, the what ifs started. We also have the I should haves, sometimes I shouldn't haves, followed by negative self-talk. It's often really irrational. It's not very realistic. So we might have things like, I shouldn't have worn that shirt because now everybody hates me. Or, you know, I should have done something else different, otherwise things wouldn't be so awful. And that's usually sort of stuck on replay. It's like a loop in your brain that you just can't stop. It might sound like I can't or I never could. Like, um, we see this a lot with adolescents. I just, I can't go to gym class. I just can't. Or, um, you know, I never could, I never could get on the track team. So I'm just not even going to try. And again, these are beliefs and thoughts that get stuck in the brain and sort of overtake things and prevent you from being able to do the things. The please don't make me. So I'm sure parents, caregivers, You've heard this probably from your kids on more than one occasion. Things like, please don't make me go to school today. Please don't make me have to make that telephone call because I just can't talk on the phone to people. You also will come into some bartering here sometimes where a kid's like, please don't make me go to school. If you don't make me go to school today, I promise I will go every day next week. But the thing with anxiety is that if you give in to that avoidance, then the next time you're feeling that way, the avoidance is going to seem like that's the thing to fix it. And so that kind of bartering from an anxiety perspective generally does not work. So the please don't make me go to school, if you don't encourage them to go to school, they're probably not going to follow through on going every day next week. So again, and these are repetitive talks, repetitive thoughts, that are scenarios that go over and over and over in your head, it's on a loop, and either you're really stuck on something that already did happen and you're really sort of beating yourself up, or you're really caught on something that might happen in the future and you're planning and planning. And there's certainly a difference between planning, like I'm planning on going to the grocery store, what things am I going to buy, versus I'm going to have this thing happen and I'm going to come up with 30 of the most catastrophic, terrible things that might happen so that I can be prepared for that. There's a real difference. So what does anxiety feel like? All of these things, you're worried, you're sort of keyed up, you have shallow breath, it might be hard to take a deeper breath, hard time concentrating, paying attention to things, irritability, fatigue or difficulty sleeping. So what can happen is you get really, really tired and yet you can't sleep. Sometimes, and panic attacks are like a really extreme 
uh, manifestations of these symptoms. So nausea, sweating, shaking, feeling really stuck or really trapped. I've heard it described by people that when having a panic attack, it feels like they're dying. They can't breathe, they're stuck. So it feels terrible for people. So um, tips for managing anxiety. Um, we wanna talk about some of the things that you can do as parents, caregivers. I'm talking to, to you as mostly parents, caregivers, but again, this is things that you can do to help any loved one and to help yourself. So uh, some of the things that people don't often talk about or, or think about in, um, sorry, trying to have some technical difficulties here. Not Sometimes, a problem. Uh, what's that? Is it not a problem? So um, sometimes people want to think about diet in terms of just weight loss or the things that um, you need to do to be healthier or whatever. But when we're talking about anxiety, it's really important to drink a lot of water, eat fresh fruits and veggies, obviously having a regular eating schedule. So let's talk for a minute though about sugar, caffeine, alcohol, and excessive junk food. So these are again, things that people are awful like often thinking that that's just for weight loss or whatever. But like I had said a moment ago, anxiety shows up in the body like you're feeling keyed up, like you're feeling revved up, you feel jittery. Um, and that kind of feeling when you're feeling anxious can be a cue to your body that there's something anxiety producing happening when in fact maybe nothing is happening. So it's harder to remain calm when you're feeling like that. So if you think about things like caffeine and sugar, people do start their day with caffeine. People sometimes take that midday slump and they hit it with some caffeine or, or like a Red Bull or a Monster. And so what you're doing effectively is revving up your body to be able to push through whatever it is that's happening. But if you think about anxiety, and your body is already really keyed up and jittery, and then you add that on there, you're exacerbating, you're making it much, much worse. So people with anxiety uh, probably should try to avoid or minimize some of those kinds of things. Um, alcohol too, let's talk about alcohol. Sometimes people feel like it's technically a depressant, so if you're feeling stressed, sometimes people have a drink at the end of the day and they feel like it really calms you down. What happens in the body after you drink alcohol is that your body metabolizes that and turns that to sugar. So here we go again, after the metabolism, now we've got sugar in the body and we're revved up again. You might have experienced this yourself or seen someone else experience it and you have a little maybe too much to drink and you're exhausted and you go to bed or you pass out and you're so tired and three, four hours later, you're wide awake, you can't go back to sleep tired but you're wide awake and that's because that alcohol has converted into sugar in your body now we're right back at the place where we started where the anxious body reaction is happening so nicotine has this sort of same effect um, nicotine also revs up the body and people will say oh i just have to step out have a cigarette it'll calm me down i think what actually is the calming factor is the stepping away taking a break because the nicotine in your body has that same kind of revving up sort yeah. of fact. Yeah, and that's a big issue right now with the amount of juuling that, that's been happening with the young people. Yeah. Yes, for sure. Mm -hmm. And they think that juuling is less dangerous for them mm -hmm. than smoking. But yeah. So it's interesting to just really focus on what nicotine does in the body. Yeah. Yeah, do you want to say a word about that? Or? No, I just, I love the way that you described that because um, I've heard so many people speak about it as a calming factor. Right. And so to be able to see it through the lens where, where that's not really true, the reaction of nicotine, so. Right. So thank you for that. Sure. Yeah. So tip number two, exercise. And people think, I can't run, I'm not a runner, I'm not very strong, I can't even do one push up. That's okay. I'm not talking about exercise to train for a marathon. Really simple things, walking, walk around your neighborhood, walk around your house, walk in the woods, walk out to your mailbox, get out in nature. Studies 
all kinds of science and studies have shown that just being out in nature and fresh air is healing and calming. Choose to move your body around doing everyday tasks, like instead of uh, using the remote to change the channel, get up and walk over there while you're talking on the phone, do lunges to the bathroom. The other day I was on a conference call um, and I put my headphones in and I just did lunges around my yard. I have a privacy fence so that nobody else can see what I was doing, but just to move your body a little bit. Science has shown that it increases your self, um, self-confidence, your well-being, in addition to all of the health benefits. Think about if you are a person or if someone you love is a person who has anxiety, whose thoughts are really stuck in believing they can't do something. Exercise can really just improve your self-esteem, your self-confidence, your belief in your own ability to accomplish things that you did not previously think that you could accomplish. So sometimes people might set an alarm or a timer as a prompt to get up and stretch and move because if you're limiting sedentary time, so you're sitting, you're watching Netflix, you're binging whatever it is you're binging and you look at your watch and you think, oh my goodness, six hours just passed. So to set some sort of a timer to take a break from that, to get up, to move around. Mm -hmm. Sleep. We talk about sleep all the time, trying to get, you know, seven to nine hours of sleep. Try to go to bed and wake around the same time each day. Get your body into a routine and limit screen time an hour before going to sleep. So the reason this is important, again, sleeping nighttime is best because your body generally responds to daytime, or nighttime, and the light and the dark. This is the only time your body and your brain really have an opportunity to relax, to heal, to regenerate some of those um, stress things that have happened all through the day. Um, and what happens right before bed, a lot of times people think, I'm just going to binge watch some Netflix, or I'm going to use my social media for an hour and that really calms me down. And it may calm you down, you think, but that blue light from the screen is activating your brain. And again, going back to what anxiety feels like, it's activation, it's your brain feeling activated. So that blue light from the screen actually really activates your brain and then your body and physiological response. So Iona, I think, is going to go over some tips and techniques in a little bit to try to calm those things down. But mm -hmm. often when I've spoken to parents and to young people, they have no idea that that's what's happening in their body. So I wanted to bring that piece up. Yeah. And I think for, for young people, adolescents, teenagers particularly, the sleep is a hard one because they, yeah. you know, they're... Um, biologically not ready to fall asleep during the hours that they would need to, to get those seven to nine. Um, so it's a struggle for them to figure out how to downregulate their nervous systems enough to, to fall asleep. So, yeah. Yeah. It's really important. It's really I important. know. So that's a lot of information. I'm sorry I threw so much information at you. You're thinking, what Kelly can I do to help my loved one? Because yes, this all sounds familiar. Yes, I've seen all of this happening. Mm -hmm. And in particular right now, we're filming this in the middle of COVID. We're filming this in the middle of some pretty significant racial tensions in our country. Everybody's anxiety is just a little bit elevated right now. So what can I do? What can you do to help your loved ones? There's a lot of stuff we can do. Family check-ins, keeping things positive and neutral with those lines of communication. It is essential that we keep the lines of communication open because as high as like one in three adolescents have clinically significant anxiety symptoms. Wow. They benefit from your support. They benefit from your guidance. They benefit from you helping to problem solve. You can help them see other points of view. For example, a kid might come home and say, my teacher hates me. They gave me an F. And you might be able to say, did you do your best work? Did you kind of mess up? Did other kids in the class get Fs? So maybe the teacher doesn't actually hate you. Maybe the teacher, teacher was just giving you some feedback on the work you did. So you keeping those lines of communication open and the check-ins 
is really important. Um, Regular-ish routines. I know that we are in an age where families just can't have a regular five o'clock dinner time every night. So um, as predictable as things can be in your environment is really important. Um, having some regular checking in, you know, that your kid knows every day when they get home from school, you're going to say, how was your day? Or if your kid doesn't talk a lot, you might want to give a prompt, like, what was the best thing that happened to you today? Tell me two things about what happened between the time you got on the bus and got off the bus. Giving some really specific uh, questions that they can answer. Um, again, being routine and predictable. So you're keeping those lines of communication open is really important because, for example, if you're at work and your boss only talks to you when you're in trouble, when you see the boss coming to you, you're going to be all like, God, what did I do this time? You don't want your kiddos to feel like that. You want your kids to see you coming and know that there is any, any number of things that you might want to speak to them about. So keeping those positive and neutral lines of communication open. This is especially important around adolescence and substance use and other risk-taking behaviors. You want your child to be able to come to you and say, my friends are using pot and I don't know what I should do or you know, I was at this party last night and I accidentally got drunk. You want your kiddos to share those things with you. These are probably things that are some sort of symptom of anxiety or even depression. You want your kids to be able to share those things with you. So keeping those lines of communication open. If you have a younger one, you might want to try a worry box where a kiddo could just write down or even draw a picture of things that are on their mind, of things that might be worrying them. This is so important, I can't emphasize this one enough. Support them to manage their anxiety instead of doing it for them. So when you allow them to avoid an anxiety producing situation, they learn that that is the best way to manage their anxiety around that situation. Therefore, the next time they have to, I don't know, I keep using gym class, a lot of kids are are really avoiding of gym class. That's the true. next time class comes around, they were like, oh, so I skipped gym last time. I'm gonna skip gym again this time. And now I feel good. So the more they avoid things and the more you allow them to avoid those things, um, and the more you help them through those things, the less able they are going to feel to be able to handle those situations when they come up in the future. Mm -hmm. And so again, we're going to reach out to local resources, find a therapist, CBT stands for Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. Again, it's really, really effective in anxiety treatment. I do wanna say that anxiety and depression do go hand in hand. And so often the anxiety feeds the depression, feeds the anxiety, feeds the depression. And so as soon as you see someone getting caught in that cycle, it's best to intervene right then and there so that you can teach them skills, so that you can teach them strategies, so that they are learning healthy things to do rather than the unhealthy or the risk-taking behavior because that's the biggest thing we see with adolescents is trying to manage their big feelings by taking risks. And so we want to help support that. Yeah. So, Iona. Do you have any questions? Well, one thing that just stuck out with me with that last slide is how you, you spoke about one in three adolescents um, are really navigating anxiety in a, a very real way. And I think that's important information for our parents and for the young people, because I think um, in both situations, people feel like they're alone with it, um, yes. that it's not... Um, something other people are dealing with to the same the same extremes but i know that when i've done mindfulness work with young people and i speak about um that sort of anxiety building and then what it sort of feels like when you almost feeling like you're having that anxiety attack and you know if i'm in a, a pe class for instance and and talking to young people every single head in the room is shaking right, right. so they all know what this feeling feels like um yes so 
so I think that that's really important and that um, I love the, the communication. One of the things that the coalition has done is created a series of um, mini videos about speaking to your teens. These are, those are particular to speaking to your teens about um, substances, but really the basis is that keeping communication open, right? That um, through, if we're speaking about anxiety or we're speaking about substance use, that the lines of communication and real true conscious listening um, is happening. It's happening. Yeah. No, if you're paying attention or if you're not, they certainly do. They 100% do. Right. You're driving in a car and they, you say, how's your day? And they talk to you. And then later on, they refer to something and you don't know what they're talking about. They know. They, they, know. Ab they absolutely know. Yeah. They also have very good BS meters. Uh, yes. They're very honed. <laughs> so yes. being authentic and true is, is important in that too. In that too. Um, so Anything else that you'd like to share with us before we do a little breath work or how you're... I just, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about it because like you said, anxiety, it's about one in three adolescents because obviously they're going through puberty, they're going through, they're trying to figure out who they are and their reference point are other kids their age. And mm -hmm. so they're trying to break away from you and develop who they are. And so that anxiety and that depression goes way up during that time. But even as adults, uh, somewhere around 20%, like one in five adults suffer from clinical anxiety yeah. stuff. So um, what are the things that you want to do if you're noticing those things, if you're noticing there are safety issues, if you're noticing that that anxiety or depression is really getting in the way of you being able to do the things in your life that you're supposed to be doing, whether it's going to school or showing up for a job or if relationships are suffering, that's another time to reach out and mm -hmm. ask for some help, some professional intervention. Yeah, thank you for that. Sure. Um, so what I wanted to end on was just to do a little bit of breath work, super simple, but um, I've worked a lot with adolescents in, in the high schools, uh, mostly doing some yoga and mindfulness. And what has been reported back to me that from young people is that the thing they used the most was, um, was the breath work that was taught. Um, and, and there's a reason for that, right? It's the biggest bang for the buck. It's easy, it's with you all the time. Um, and I mean, I refer to it as a superpower really, because it, it is a thing that keeps us alive. It's the first thing that we do when we're born. and. Um, and is the indicator of passing on. And we um, have the ability to consciously go in and shift our patterns of breathing. And by doing that, it's like the secret portal into our autonomic nervous system so that we actually can start to have some agency and some control over whether or not um, we're just in that really high stress branch of the nervous system that you're describing, which happens when anxiety is kicked in. Um, and it's the breath that can sort of go into that portal and help us to help to mitigate that and balance out um, so that we can come back to a little bit more calm. And so I, we're just gonna talk about two breaths. One is a letting go breath. And a letting go breath is literally that. We're like, we're feeling a little frustrated, tense, stressed. We feel some anxiety starting to build. And what we're doing is we're replicating a sigh that um, our bodies would go into anyway. So it's an inhale through the nose and it's an exhale through the mouth. And so I don't know if you want to just take a couple of those letting go breaths, we'll just demonstrate that. But the goal is that we want to take a really easy, big inhale. So we're inhaling more than we normally would air. And then the exhale is going to come through the mouth. And this one's a little bit stronger. So it's a strong exhale through the mouth. Let's do that a couple more times. Big, easy inhale through the nose and then a strong exhale through the mouth. And one more. So that letting go breath for me, it's like you're just letting a little steam off. It's just helping to take it down a notch or two in a really quick, easy way. Um, and then the second breath that, uh, that is really useful is to come into this would be nose breathing in and out and the reason of breathing in and out through the nose is 
the primary point here is that it helps to slow the breath down. And so it also helps to slow the exhalation. And we, there's a correlation between a longer, um, more complete exhalation to help calm the nervous system, which when we're in anxiety is, is ratcheted up quite a bit. Um, and then what we're gonna come into here is nose breathing, but we're gonna do it in a version of belly breaths. And we're not actually breathing into our bellies when we, <laughs> we call it a belly breath. Um, and the reason we call it a belly breath is there's expansion in the whole waist area when you do bring the breath down into the base of the lungs. So the intention when you're taking in your easy, big, full breath is that you're directing it. Most of us just breathe up here. And if we're in full anxiety, this is the only place we're breathing, short, shallow breaths. And so we want to interrupt the short, shallow breathing cycle and be able to lengthen it and expand it a little bit. And so by breathing through the nose, we can do that. And by just imagining and, and directing it with our intention down to the base of um, the lungs. And we're not used to breathing this way, so it might not come the first time at all. But I'm going to just put both hands on my belly just so you can see that. I'm going to sit back down. And um, over the next few breaths, Again, if it's available to you without a cold, you can breathe in and out through the nose and the inhales are nice and easy. Directing down to the waist. So maybe you're feeling expansion and the hands rising with the inhale and then contracting with the exhale. And with the exhale, we wanna see if we can follow the breath all the way out. So there's a little bit of engagement of your core muscles to just gently press the breath out. And then a big inhale, nice and easy, down into the base of the lungs, the belly expands. Exhale, you press the breath out. And there's a whole bunch of imagery that we could, we could think about. For teens, I like to think about um, filling up water balloons. So that when you're filling, if you're equating the breath to be like the water, it goes down to the base first and it expands there. And then, if you were to pour it out, you're gonna pour all the way out that way. And then if you wanna come into a more complete breath, you build on your belly breath and you just inhale. First you fill down the base of the lungs and then just keep inhaling till you feel full. And the second you feel like you're full or you're starting to force, that's when you know it's time to start your exhalation. And let's just take two more like that. Your own version of a full complete breath. And then we'll end with going back to that letting go breath. So on your next inhale, make it a big, easy inhale through the nose. And then a strong exhale through the mouth. Thank you for sharing that. And, um, and I hope that that just easy tip of coming back to the breath that brings us back into our body and out of the mind. Um, and then it really is that, that superpower of being able to have some agency over your nervous system. So, and as you spoke about, you know, we're adolescents in general are struggling and with issues of anxiety and depression and the moment that they are in right now of not being in school um, and being at home and not around their peers and they're, they're hardwired and needing that kind of connectivity. Um, you were speaking about the Black Lives Matter. Right now, there's a, um, here locally in Great Barrington, there's a march happening right now that I know a lot of our young people are at. Um, and so there's a lot of, a lot going on for all of us. And so thank you so much for your expertise and everything that you shared with us. And I wish you well um, as we get through the rest of these challenging times of trying to navigate through. Um, through everything that is going on with the virus and, and beyond. So thank you again. Thank you. All right. Bye, Kelly.